I am your host, Eric Bjornstad, and I am your guide to the ever-changing world of fuel. This is a podcast for anyone who uses fuel or who has things that use fuel, whether that's at work or at home. It's also for consumers and for professionals who work in jobs and in positions where one of the things that they may have to do is manage fuel so that that fuel can be used in some capacity to get their job done. And that means the Fuel Pulse Show podcast is for everybody. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, today we want to talk about this thing called ASTM D975, otherwise called the Standard Specification for Diesel Fuel Oil. If you manage fuel in any significant capacity, you are likely to be well familiar with it already. D975 is the standard specification for diesel fuel oils, and it is maintained and developed by ASTM International, which is the group that establishes the technical standards for a wide range of materials and products and services that touch virtually every area of our professional and personal lives. So what we're going to do today is we want to look a little bit more closely at D975, not just as a, some kind of academic exercise, but because we want to talk about something that we might call the myth of D975. And so what is this myth of D975? Is it that it's really just not that important? Uh, well, no, D975 is pretty important. No, the myth of D975 really has to do with this idea that if you test your stored diesel fuel and it comes back as meeting all of these D975 requirements, then you don't have anything to worry about. Now, we'll just leave it like that for now because we don't want to give too much away, but that is what we're going to talk about today. What this specification called D975 and all its elements, what they mean for your stored fuel, both in terms of what your fuel is like right now, and then also looking forward to what the idea of whether you need to do anything else for your fuel versus whether your fuel is home free with nothing whatsoever to worry about. So the myth of D975 is that meeting its requirements is the be all and end all, the only thing that's important when it comes to your stored fuel. And what we're going to find as we unpack this a little more is that yes, D975 is pretty important, but it would be a mistake to think that it is the only thing you have to think about. So let's dive on in and talk about the myth of D975. So the big thing that ASTM D975 does is it lists out the requirements for the quality and the performance characteristics diesel fuel oils. Now, the latest iteration of D975 from 2018, I believe, is 28 pages long. It's a little booklet. It's about 28 pages long. And throughout its pages, it covers a wide or a broad range of relevant subtopics. For example, there are a number of pages with data relating to cold flow temperatures in different states, which would be useful for professionals planning for winter fuel treatment. Now, the parts that we're concerned with are the parts of the standard that define those properties and specifications that the various grades of diesel fuel should meet. Now, in principle, this helps ensure that those fuels meet the necessary standards for quality and consistency so that they will function properly in the engine and they'll minimize the possibility of problems happening when the fuels are used. Now, sometimes when trying to describe its importance, D975 may be called the legal standard for diesel fuel. I know that in the past I have used that at some point, but it's not actually a legal definition established by a government authority. So it's not completely accurate to describe it as such, but it would be accurate to say that ASTM D975 is the accepted de facto standard adopted by everyone that means anything in the market. How so? Well, just look at how it informs the issues of both uh, regulatory compliance and also how it intersects with industry consensus. All right, so regulatory compliance. All countries around the world have regulations that govern fuel quality. 
and many of those regulations in those other countries, they will reference ASTM standards like the 975 in their requirements. That means that all those manufacturers and suppliers of diesel fuel in those countries, they end up using D975 as a guideline to ensure compliance with their own regulatory requirements. So therefore, while it's not a legal definition, D975 is very deeply intertwined with the requirements in all those countries. And then there's simply the fact of industry consensus. All ASTM standards are developed through a collaborative process that involves a bunch of different stakeholders uh, in the area of petroleum sciences and fuels for 975. And because the 975 comes out of such a collaborative process, it represents a consensus view of what the market thinks diesel fuel should be. And the credibility of D975 comes not from being something that was just you know, handed down from on high by some bureaucrat. The industry itself got together and decided what it should be. So while it may not be a legal definition in the strictest sense, its role in shaping all of these areas is pretty, uh, you know, pretty significant. Now, let's look at uh, what's listed, what's actually contained in D975, what its elements are. Now, if you had the, the, the booklet in front of you and you looked on page five, you would find table one. Table one is the table that lists the 12 essential properties for diesel fuel oils. Now, in table one, when you look at it, you'll see that each property has, of course, the name of the property and then the required standard order or result. And it may have different results for different kinds of diesel fuel covered by the standard. And then it also would define what other ASTM test method should be used to measure that property. And that's probably a good idea because you want to make sure that everyone is measuring that result in the same standardized way. Now, let's go through these 12 and briefly detail why they matter for diesel fuels. So the first one you find is Flashpoint. Now, Flashpoint itself is not directly related to engine performance unless it was just off by some massive amount. But it is very important in terms of fuel handling and storage. I mean, if your Flashpoint uh, is supposed to be 160 degrees and it's gotten contaminated and it's now the actual Flashpoint is on the 40 degrees, you've got, a, you know, you've got an increased fire risk, increased handling risk. You definitely don't want that. So Flashpoint uh, is the first property that's specified. Second property that's specified is water and sediment content. Now, this defines the maximum amount of water and sediment together that are allowed to be present in diesel fuel. Now, if you have too much water and or too much sediment, you have too much of those things, you'll get a whole bunch of problems that it will contribute to. Incomplete combustion. It'll affect the power and the fuel efficiency of the engine. It will affect the way the fuel atomizes through the injectors. It will affect development of corrosion and rust in the, in, in, in the system. It, will, it has implications for whether microbial growth is likely to develop. It has implications on fuel stability as well. So water and sediment test is a pretty important part of D975. So too is the third one, distillation temperature. Now distillation temperature of fuel matters because it will affect the performance and the behavior of fuel in the engine. Now, all fuels, whether you're talking about diesel fuel or whether you're talking about gasoline, they are actually blends or mixtures of different components that are put together at the refinery level. And all of these different components vaporize and combust at different temperatures. Now, here's why that's important. First of all, when you talk about vaporization and combustion in the engine, fuel has to vaporize in an engine environment in order for it to work. Now, the distillation temperature provides insight into the temperature range at which the various components of that diesel fuel mix will start to vaporize. And if it's not in the right range, then that fuel is not going to vaporize at the right time, which means you'll get problems like incomplete combustion, you'll get higher emissions, and your engine's not going to be as efficient as it needs to be. Uh, another factor to consider is cold weather, uh, cold start performance. During cold weather, Diesel fuel has to vaporize quickly in order to facilitate you know, ignition and combustion in that engine. If the fuel's distillation characteristics are off, if they're not suitable for cold temperatures, 
then you're going to get difficulty in, start, difficulty in starting, poor combustion, again, increased smoke emissions. is not going to work right, basically. And there are other factors, too, like it can, you know, distillation temperatures can affect the ignition delay, but I think you get the point. Distillation temperature is specified by D975 because the industry knows that it has to fall within a certain range of temperature for the fuel to work properly in the engine and avoid causing problems. Okay, the next one is what they call kinematic viscosity, or just call it viscosity. Now, viscosity is an important property of diesel fuel because it directly affects both the fuel's uh, what we'll call flow behavior, and then also the fuel's ability to lubricate and cool various engine components. So diesel fuel needs the right viscosity, or it needs viscosity to be in the right range so that it will flow smoothly through the fuel lines and it, so that it will inject properly. If the viscosity is too high, then it can lead to all sorts of issues. I mean, fuel line clogging could be one of them. Poor atomization during injection is a big one. You'll get reduced engine performance, emissions, all sorts of things associated with that. Another problem that's not, not thought of as much as that is if the viscosity is off, it will affect the fuel's ability to absorb and carry heat away from engine parts. See, like lubricating oil, fuel has a particular function it, it fulfills that particular function in the areas that it goes to. And if the viscosity is off and it doesn't flow as well as it needs to, that will affect uh, the operating temperature in the engine and it will create potential thermal stresses in the engine uh, in areas that it doesn't need to be. So kinematic viscosity is important to fuel and it's specified in D975. Ash percentage is another one. Um, all fuel has ash forming components in it usually in two forms, either uh, things that form abrasive solids or things that are what we call soluble metallic soaps. And when the fuels burn, whatever of these are in the fuel will form ash and they'll form deposits in the engine. And so obviously limiting the amount of these kinds of things in the fuel is probably a good thing. And so D975 does. Sulfur level is specified. Now, by, by now, if you've been in the industry for any amount of time, we're all well familiar with sulfur regulations, right? In addition to helping with the environmental concerns, uh, all of today's diesel engines have emissions control catalysts. And these emissions control catalysts are extremely sensitive to sulfur in the exhaust. So you have to limit or cap the amount of sulfur in the fuel to protect those things. And so sulfur is part of D975. Uh, next one is something called copper strip corrosion. This is one of the few predictive tests. In fact, it may be the only purely predictive test in D975. And it has to do with simulating whether corrosion will occur after the fuel has been exposed to certain copper-based materials. Obviously, you want to minimize the amount of that that would happen in the fuel. And so you have copper strip corrosion as part of D975. Uh, cetane number or cetane index, both of those are you are allowed to be used in D975, and they both are measures of the ignition quality of the fuel. If these are not high enough, then you're going to, it's going to influence combustion. It's going to influence combustion roughness and operation of the engine. Cloud point or cold filter plug point, both of those are specified in D975, but these are a little bit unique. Now, the idea of paying attention to the cold weather gelling temperatures or the flow temperatures of fuel, um, the fact that they're listed in table one means you should pay attention to those. However, this is a, they are unique in D975 in that it doesn't actually define a standard for those things. Instead, there's a footnote in the table. And the footnote basically says that there's too much it depends, quote unquote, to, for them to define what a minimum temperature standard should be across the board. They just recommend that you pay attention to what those properties are for your fuel that you're getting. Uh, next one, something called Ramsbottom carbon residue. Carbon residue is really the important part of that name. And it is a measure of the carbon depositing tendencies of the fuel when it's heated up. Ideally, you want fuel that keeps this to a minimum. And then the last two of the 12 are lubricity, which is the fuel's ability to prevent friction and wear in key engine parts like 
injectors and fuel pumps. And then the last one is what they call conductivity, which is a measure of the fuel's ability to conduct and dissipate static electricity buildup. This is very important for safe handling and transport of the fuel. So those are the 12 key properties defined in D975. Now, it's notable that there are some important things not listed in D975, like a test for microbial levels. Now, we might ask, why not? Uh, I mean, aren't elevated microbial levels evidence of a problem such that D975 would want to include them? Well, we do know that elevated microbial levels are highly correlated with the development of a range of problems in the fuel. Problems that typically would manifest themselves at some point in the future. But since D975 is concerned mostly with current problems in the fuel, uh, we would ask, are microbial levels always correlated with existing problems like that? And the answer to that is not always. If, microbe, if microbes or microbial levels were causing existing problems in that sense, then likely what you would have in addition is you would have one or more additional failing ASTM tests that would point out that problem. Like, for example, a, a, an out-of-spec water and sediment result. See, most of the D975 tests, like water and sediment, they are descriptive tests. They describe what's true of the fuel at the time that you are testing. Uh, flashpoint. The flashpoint of the fuel is 145 degrees. You are not predicting what the flashpoint of the fuel is going to be at some point in the future. No, you are uh, being descriptive of a property of the fuel right now at this time. Most of the ASTM uh, D975 tests are like that. Now, on the flip side from the descriptive tests are what we term predictive tests. Uh, predictive tests are tests that don't focus on showing you as much what's true of the fuel right now, is they want to give you an idea of what you might see happen down the road if things remain the same. Um, and there's another test, not in D975, that's also really important. And like microbial, it too has perhaps the most value as a predictive indicator, and that is stability tests. Uh, whenever we say stability tests, there are two main stability tests to be concerned with. There's oxidative and thermal. The one that we tend to be most concerned about is oxidative. So that's what we'll use from now on. Oxidative stability, uh, it, it's, it's an, it, the test result is an, in what we call an index expression. It's an expression of the likelihood of, that the fuel's condition is going to change at some point in the future. Now, the oxidative stability test it doesn't tell you something like, uh, say, if the water and sediment levels are elevated at time of testing. No, it's a predictive test. And what they do is they're trying to basically do doing things like exposing the fuel to higher levels of oxygen and more heat. They're essentially trying to compress time. They're trying to speed time up. Um, and, and they're trying to get those chemical precursors that are in the fuel, assumed to be in the fuel already. They're trying to get those to react, basically speed up the effects of what they're going to do in the fuel. And they're trying to demonstrate what you might be likely to see in the fuel in the future, again, if nothing changes. The fuel is being a predictive test. Predict what's going to happen. So let's say that you have an elevated oxidative stability score in your fuel. Now, we know that that result says something about what might happen in the future. But can we say anything about the fuel's condition right now based on that? Is there anything descriptive that we can say about the fuel's condition right now based on those stability results? I mean, surely they mean something in that respect, right? Uh, I mean, another way to, to ask that question would be, does fuel with a bad stability score have elevated sediment levels at the present time? Well, the answer to that question is no, not necessarily. In fact, uh, probably not. And you wouldn't measure that with a stability test anyway. You'd measure that with a water and sediment test. It is actually more common than you might think for fuel with a poor stability score to appear to have nothing wrong with it, at least in the sense that it doesn't look like there's anything off about it. 
Okay, but something is off about it because the stability score is bad. There is something that caused that to happen, and it's something that is in the fuel. Um, we know in principle that water and sediment aren't the causes of instability. We know they can be products of it, but they're not the cause of it. What causes instability and what causes the eventual development of sediments in fuel are the reactive molecules, what we might call the reactive species. Reactive molecules that are in the fuel that drive and participate in chemical chain reactions that happen in the fuel over time and eventually form these things. And the more of these precursor molecules, the more of them that are in the fuel to start with, the faster the fuel is going to become unstable in the future. So does that fuel with that elevated, that poor stability score, does it have elevated levels of these reactive molecules in the fuel? In that sense, yes, absolutely. And so in that sense, a stability test is being descriptive in that narrow sense that it's saying you have a higher uh, amount or greater content of reactive species in your fuel. But the oxidative stability test doesn't focus on the descriptive picture in the sense that it does something like measure those reactive products. It doesn't do that in the same sense that the water and sediment test actually does measure water and sediment. No. It's oxidative stability test is predictive because it's forcing whatever's in the fuel to react, and then it's seeing if the condition of the fuel changes an abnormal amount as a result of that. So it's important for us to understand the difference between what's in the fuel right now versus what tests might be telling us concerning a predictive picture of what we might expect to see happening in the fuel in the future if nothing changes. And the better we understand the difference between those two things, the better we're going to understand this, this question we're asking, which is what is this myth of D975? So let's get into that. We've laid the groundwork. Now let's start talking about this myth of 975. What is it? Well, in short, the myth of D975 is the assumption that if my fuel passes all of the D975 specs, it meets all of those specs, then I won't have problems right now, and I shouldn't expect to have problems in the future. That's the myth of D975 because people believe that. People assume that those are true. Is that a reasonable assumption? Well, I mean, that's an important question. Is it reasonable to believe that? Well, let's take the first part. Let's break it up into two parts. The first part, I won't have problems if I pass D975 right now. For that part, that is intended to be pretty close to the truth. The point of D975, remember, is to define a set of properties that uh, if the fuel meets all of those things, if it meets those different standards, right, then you shouldn't expect to have operational problems when you use that fuel. You should expect everything to work the way that you need it to. Because remember, if your fuel passes D975, then what's true of the fuel? Well, the flash point is where it's supposed to be. The distillation temperature is where it's supposed to be. It's free enough of water and sediment. Um, you know, the viscosity is correct. All of these other things, ash residue is going to be at a minimum. All of, things are, all of those things are going to be true. If, so if your diesel fuel satisfies all those cr criteria right now, it should work without the expectation of any problems in your diesel engine. Now, are there any exceptions to this? Sure, but those are more situational uh, exceptions. Uh, there's the two big ones, the two big situational exceptions that stand out are cold flow and cetane. You know, cold flow. Remember that was called out in D975. And it told us from the get-go that it, that was a situational thing anyway. It depended on the needs of your engine. It depended on your operational parameters, your climate, things like that. So, um, you know, they didn't call out any specific standards for that anyway. Uh, the other situational one, though, is cetane. D975 defines the minimum amount of cetane value for diesel fuels supposed to be 40. Now, however, we do know that there are some engines that need higher than that. 
And so any performance problems you might get would, wouldn't be because uh, it's a problem with your fuel, essentially. It's because your engine needs higher cetane level. And, that's, and D975 cannot account for every possible situ uh, engine that needs a higher cetane rate. Okay, so first half of the myth, if you pass D975, you shouldn't have any problems. In the present time, that's a correct assumption. That's a reasonable assumption. But the second one, the second half of the myth is if I pass D975, I shouldn't expect to have problems in the future. And that is where we have to take a step back. Uh, I mean, there is a big difference between not expecting problems right now if you're using the fuel versus not expect, but versus using the fuel right now and then saying, I shouldn't have any problems in the future going forward. Remember, D975 tests are, as we said, mostly all descriptive. They're not intended to be predictive in the way that, say, an oxidative stability test might be. And so when you go from no problems now to no problems in the future, there's something that's missing in that assumption, and that is you're not accounting for this, this black hole of uncertainty, which is the fact that conditions might change in the future. Things can happen in the future that may lead to problems developing, even if your fuel is in perfect condition in the present moment. So this idea that if the fuel is good now, it means that it will always be problem-free in the future. Uh, we should be able to see the problems in that logic pretty immediately. Uh, now, what kind of future fuel problems might we have in spite of our fuel meeting D975 right now? Well, there are at least two things that we can point to, and those are ones that we have already mentioned, which is microbial and oxidative stability. Now, D975, remember, we said D975 doesn't specify either of these. In, among its 12 tests listed in Table 1. So D975 doesn't specify that the fuel has to be free or even low in microbial contamination for it to pass. Well, why not? Um, well, you know, the fact that it doesn't say this doesn't mean it's saying that having high levels of microbial contamination is good. I mean, intuitively, it seems like a good idea for your fuel to be relatively microbe-free. But at the same time, one of the reasons that microbial contamination is a bad thing is because it leads to other problems developing in the fuel, not just in the fuel, but also in your storage tank and all these other places that are outside the purview of 975. But it can lead to other problems, you know, problems like corrosion, uh, development of sediment. And D975 would actually cover a lot of these other problems in its other tests. The point, though, is that you could take fuel that was contaminated with a high microbial level. You could use it in an engine, and it would operate, in most cases, it would operate just fine if it didn't fail in these other areas. And if it didn't operate just fine, then that, would, that wouldn't be because you had high levels of yeasts or whatever in your fuel. It would be because those high microbial levels caused the fuel to fail in one of these other areas that D975 is probably going to catch anyway. Now, D975 also doesn't specify that the fuel has to pass a stability test. Again, this is because stability testing, whether you're talking about oxidative or thermal, those are predictive tests. They are supposed to predict whether, if nothing changes in the way the fuel is handled or stored, whether it will develop instability products in the future. Now, let's double down on that point to kind of close things out here. What we have to remember about what D975 is telling us is that there is this underlying assumption in all of this that there is no way to know if the fuel storage conditions are going to change. Because the storage conditions in some part are up to us. D975 can't predict what we're going to do. Stability tests, in principle, they're important, but... If the fuel you know, fails or gets a bad score on a stability test, it doesn't mean that the fuel can't be used right now, um, nor does it guarantee that its condition is going to degrade in the future. Why not? I mean, isn't that the whole point of the test? Well, the problem is because it doesn't know if something's going to change about the fuel's situation. I mean, 
there are any number of things that could happen in the future to a tank of fuel that has a poor stability score. I mean, you could add stabilizer to it. You could get it polished. The environmental conditions that that fuel is being stored in, those could change for the better so that the reactive processes in the fuel slow down and things have start happening slower. Any of those things could happen. And then consider the flip side. Let's say you have fuel that gets a great score on oxidative stability, but that doesn't mean that something might change for the worse tomorrow. Temperatures and environmental conditions could change. You could have things introduced into the tank that cause more of these reactive elements to develop and then start their chain reactions. You could get microbial contamination in the fuel at any point, really, which would then contribute to breaking the fuel down. You simply don't know, for the better or for the worse, what's going to happen in the fuel in the future. And so these kinds of testing that we're talking about, whether D975 tests or some of the other ones, they can't claim to tell you the future on any of that. The best that D975 can do is tell you what the fuel's properties are right now at this moment. It cannot tell you what their properties are going to be at some point in the future because it can't predict if anything is going to change, whether that's because you took intentional steps or because something else out of your control happened. So to close, the reality is the myth of D975 um, or discussing that myth intends, you know, it should lead us to the realization that best practice fuel management of stored fuels needs a little bit more than just relying solely on a D975 test slate. Um, and that's partly because if you're doing best practice fuel management of stored fuel, we typically would recommend some additional tests alongside some of these other D975 tests. Because while D975 offers a good, relatively complete picture of the condition that your fuel's in right now and whether you, you can expect to have problems right now, it doesn't intend to, it doesn't claim to predict future problems. But if you expand your view a little bit more, and if you consider incorporating some additional things into your planning, like maybe some additional microbial testing, some additional stability testing, if you're not doing that already, uh, you know, preemptive treatment with certain kinds of chemical fuel treatments is something else people consider. If you expand your view and consider some of these additional things other than just doing a D975 and filing that paperwork away, you will stand a great chance of minimizing future problems from happening in whatever stored fuel that you're in charge of. And so that is the myth of D975. And that is it for today's episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. You can find, as always, everything, uh, information on everything that we talked about in the show notes. Um, if you haven't already, feel free to subscribe to the Fuel Pulse Show podcast on your favorite platform whether you get it from iTunes, Stitcher, Amazon Podcast, wherever you get it from, feel free to subscribe. Of course, tell your friends. Leave us a rating. Ratings are really good because they go a really long way towards helping people find us. So thank you again for joining us for today's episode. Once again, I am your host, Eric Bjornstad, your guide through the ever-changing world of fuel. I will see you next time on the Fuel Pulse Show podcast.